So our next speaker, uh, Laura Bryden, is a Christchurch-based naturopath practicing in Sydney. Uh, and she draws on her 20 years of clinical experience as a naturopath with her previous career in science as an evolutionary biologist. So pretty uh, pleased to have an evolutionary biologist along here um, this weekend. And she brings this together to help men and women deal with hormonal health issues. Uh, her talk is on hormonal vitality. So please welcome Laura Bryden. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? okay? I'm really excited to speak to this group this afternoon. I work primarily with hormonal conditions. And over the last 20 or so years of practice, I've noticed that something bad is happening with my patients' hormones. And it's affecting all hormonal systems, including thyroid and adrenal systems. But today we're going to speak about reproductive hormones. Our reproductive hormones are powerful agents in our physiology not just for reproduction, but also for brain, bones, muscles, and metabolism. For example, we now know that our main estrogen, estradiol, plays a key role in insulin signaling in both women and men. And estradiol is why, after you adjust for muscle mass, women have enhanced insulin sensitivity compared with men. And I put that, that reference is there, actually. That, that's why I included on this slide. It makes sense that estrogen is a key part of our metabolism when you think about how ancient estrogen is. Estrogen was our first steroid hormone to evolve. It's been dated back to 450 million years ago when we shared a common ancestor with the lamprey. So you can see I take ancestral health of more of a sort of deep time evolutionary perspective. So for half a billion years, estrogen has been deeply involved with metabolism. It was a big player in physiology long before it was recruited for reproduction or secondary sex characteristics. And it's not just metabolism. Our reproductive hormones, all of them, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, are potent regulators of mood. They influence the release of neurotransmitters, and some of their metabolites are neurosteroids, which interact directly with our brain and nervous system. And for men, the importance of testosterone is pretty obvious. We all know that men need testosterone for general health, for metabolism, and for mood. And for the most part, I would argue that men still have testosterone. True, men have real reproductive problems, such as sperm count, sperm morphology, and prostate enlargement. And true, many of you may not have quite as much testosterone as you'd like, but you still have some. You have more or less managed to hold on to your main reproductive hormone, but not so for many women. We are in a very strange time for women's health. And if we ask the question, how far has women's health departed from that of our ancestors? I think the answer would have to be so far as to be almost unrecognizable. There are a few factors. First of all, <laughs> thank you. First of all, we menstruate a lot more than our ancestors did. They were probably pregnant or breastfeeding a lot more of the time and so had fewer periods. And also, there were times when our ancestors did not have enough food to ovulate. Ovulation is highly sensitive to food supply, and that plays a big role in women's health today. And the second major, can I say major, departure of women's health from our ancestors, even our very recent ancestors, is hormonal birth control. Future generations are going to look back <sighs> at what we've done to women in the last two to three generations and not be able to believe it. We have switched off women's hormones, not figuratively, but literally switched them off. 
When we give hormonal birth control, we shut down ovarian function. We switch off estradiol and replace it with a pseudo-hormone called ethanol estradiol, which has very different effects. Remember I said earlier that estradiol improves insulin sensitivity. Well, ethanol estradiol does the opposite. It worsens insulin sensitivity, and that's one of the ways the pill causes insulin resistance. When we give hormonal birth control, we switch off a wonderful hormone called progesterone and replace it with an odd, motley assortment of progestins, such as drospirenone and levindestrol. And to confuse things, we still use the word progesterone to refer to these drug steroids, but they're not progesterone. Progesterone is a calming, neuroprotective hormone. It metabolizes into a neurosteroid called allopregnolone, which is a potent modulator of the GABA receptor in the brain. Drospirenone, which is the progestin in Yasmin, birth control, does not metabolize to allopregnolone. <laughs> it does not help mood or brain. And in fact, many, many women report anxiety on the pill. Earlier this year, researchers at UCLA found that women who take hormonal birth control have altered brain structure compared to women with natural cycles. Parts of their frontal cortex are smaller and according to lead researcher Nicole Peterson, that change in brain structure could be why pill users commonly report anxiety. Of course, we don't know exactly what is altering the brain. It could be something like drospirenone, or it could simply be that pill users have no estradiol and no progesterone, two hormones that are very important for the brain. And progestins are different from progesterone in so many ways. The difference in molecular structures that we saw in the previous slide is a big, big deal. And if you need more convincing that the molecular structure of a hormone matters, then think about this. Progesterone is structurally more different from drospirenone than it is from testosterone. In my view, the pseudo-hormones of hormonal birth control are simply not good enough for women. They impair mood, libido, and metabolism. And for example, here's a study, in a one 10 week study, which is a good one for this group, I think. Researchers found that women taking oral contraceptives gained 60% less muscle mass with exercise compared with women with natural cycles. And that's primarily because the pill suppresses androgens that we need for muscle gain. And in the US and Australia, and probably in New Zealand and Canada as well, 80% of sexually active women have, have taken hormonal birth control at least once in their lives. And there is a growing trend to prescribe it to girls younger than 15. This is always the part where I start crying. <laughs> what is that going to do to their metabolism, and to their brains, and to their mood? But, <laughs> I'm optimistic. I think we have passed peak hormonal birth control. What I'm seeing in social media is a revolution of millennials, thank God for millennials, <laughs> embracing non-hormonal methods, such as copper IUD and fertility awareness method and condoms, and there are some really good quality condoms coming in future developments, and it's really exciting. And future generations will view women's health very differently than we do. So <laughs> that's my rant on hormonal birth control. Now let's take a look at some obstacles to hormonal vitality that affect both women and men. Obstacle number two, <laughs> standard American diet. The way we eat now is not at all friendly to our hormonal system, to say the least. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but still. The standard American diet, which is also the standard Australian diet and the standard New Zealand diet, is a diet that creates inflammation. It's a diet that depletes nutrients. It's a diet that causes insulin resistance. And it's a diet that alters our microbiome. 
inflammation, nutrient deficiency, insulin resistance, and dysbiosis. Those four things cause hormonal dysfunction. Most of the patients I work with eat a lot of inflammatory foods such as sugar, vegetable oil, and wheat. And that inflammation causes hormonal havoc. It impedes hormone production, it hypersensitizes estrogen receptors, and it blocks progesterone receptors. And that's probably why inflammation correlates very strongly with PMS symptoms, for example. Women, women with higher blood levels of inflammatory cytokines are more likely to report PMS symptoms, and that's exactly what they found in this University of Massachusetts study. The standard American diet is deficient in key nutrients that we need for hormonal vitality. It's deficient in selenium, iodine, magnesium, and I would say especially zinc, especially for women. I routinely test my patients for plasma zinc levels, and it's one of the most common deficiencies I see amongst young women. Women are zinc deficient partly because they don't regularly eat meat or seafood, and also because zinc is depleted by hormonal birth control. How does zinc affect hormones? It promotes the healthy formation of ovarian follicles and Leydig cells in men. It supports the synthesis, transport, and action of hormones such as progesterone and testosterone. So, zinc deficiency causes infertility, acne, menstrual irregularity, erectile dysfunction, and period pain. And on the other hand, zinc sufficiency prevents period pain because it downregulates inflammatory cytokines and prostaglandins, and that's what they found in a new study published in the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And in this study, it's the second one down, they gave a fairly high dose of zinc, 50 milligrams, but only for three days per month, starting on the first day of the period, and they still got results, which amazed me when I read this study. They treated zinc like a drug, and they went so far as to state, and I quote, zinc is more affordable than oral contraceptives or anti-inflammatory medication. But trust me, it works a lot better to promote long-term zinc status with zinc-rich foods or lower-dose zinc supplements given throughout the month. The standard American diet causes insulin resistance. It's mostly because of all the fructose and sugary foods, such as soft drinks and desserts, I think. But there's also, it's important to understand, there's also a lot of fructose in natural foods, such as fruit juice and dates. And date balls like these, that's why I chose date balls. Date balls like these are the nemesis of many of my patients' hormonal systems. When we're... <laughs> When we're insulin resistant, most of our tissues, such as liver and muscle, stop responding properly to insulin. But a few tissues keep responding. Adipose tissue keeps responding to insulin, which is why insulin resistance can cause weight gain. Ovaries and testes keep responding. Even when exposed to high levels of insulin, they keep responding. And in women, all that insulin stimulates the ovarian theca cells to make more testosterone instead of estrogen or progesterone. It also impairs ovulation and leads to polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. And remember I said earlier that ovulation is highly dependent on food supply. PCOS is one example of that. And in men, too much insulin causes the Leydig cells to make less testosterone. And that's why I test all of my testosterone excess women and all of my testosterone deficient men for insulin resistance. And I primarily, oh no, really? I primarily use a blood test called HOMA IR index, which is the ratio of fasting insulin and fasting blood growth. Okay. This is, I'm going to skip, I have to skip over. This is a study on um, using magnesium. Okay, the standard American diet is a, has a negative effect on our microbiome. It causes dysbiosis, and that's important because dysbiosis causes inflammation, which we spoke about earlier. And remember, inflammation causes hormonal havoc. But there's another problem. 
Dysbiosis also causes estrogen excess. It's because some bacteria have an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase, and beta-glucuronidase deconjugates estrogen, which interrupts the process of estrogen detoxification, and it puts estrogen back into circulation. And that's a problem for both women and men, and it causes things which I'm going to skip over, so, because we're running out of time. Um, so how do we keep our microbiome happy? And you know a lot of this. We eat vegetables, and we avoid antibiotics as much as we reasonably can. Antibiotics are obstacle number three. They cause dysbiosis, they, um, which causes um, inflammation and estrogen excess. They also damage our mitochondria. I'm really interested in mitochondria, which are the little ancient bacteria inside of our cells. Remember, it's the job of our mitochondria to make energy, but they have other jobs too, and one of those jobs is to manufacture steroid hormones. When we damage our mitochondria, we damage our hormonal system. So something I say to my patients all the time, finding a way to avoid future antibiotics is a key part of your long-term strategy for hormonal health. This is on environment uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals and an important statement that was released from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists this year. And they said that the scientific evidence over the last 15 years shows that exposure to toxic environmental agents can have significant and long-lasting effects on reproductive health. And the Endocrine Society said something similar. They said, I tweeted this, <laughs> it's time for endocrinologists to start advising patients to avoid endocrine disrupting chemicals. And they said that based on 1,300 studies. I'm going to... I, I keep in under 17 minutes when I was practicing this. I don't understand. <laughs> um, I think I just got too passionate. Um, we've got a long road ahead. I want to get into the next. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are obstacle number four. Finally, obstacle number five. Stress has a huge impact on hormonal health, particularly in women, but also in men. And it's not complicated. Our hormonal command center, the hypothalamus, talks to the pituitary with gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH, in my diagram. And GnRH tells the pituitary to tell the ovaries and the testes to make hormones, and stress reduces the output of, output of GnRH. And that's why stress affects fertility, it affects libido, and it definitely affects PMS. And there are other factors, two minutes, okay. And here's a study about PMS and stress. And yeah, in this study, they tracked 259 women over two cycles, and they found that women with higher levels of perceived stress were more than twice as likely to report severe PMS. Our premenstrual phase is our stress report card for the month. So if we suffer PMS, it gives us an excuse to say, in order to balance my hormones, I need to go for that walk, or book a Thai massage, or spend the entire afternoon reading a novel, which is what I do. So, what are, the modern, what are the modern obstacles to hormonal vitality? One, hormonal birth control. Two, standard American diet. Three, antibiotics. Four, endocrine disrupting chemicals. And five, stress. And I'm going to say, slip in one other thing which I kind of skipped over. When it comes to gut health and dysbiosis and its effect on hormones, it is massive. And so something that I say to my patients daily, hourly, you know, every 30 minutes, I am saying to someone, we cannot fix your hormones until we fix your gut. 